We'll use the words that are on the screen if you would speak back those that are in the red type. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. We have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I invite those who are able to stand with me as we sing a hymn together. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. So if you're able, will you stand with me as we sing together? be seated. We're going to come in prayer together using the prayer that's on the screen. Again, if you would, as a congregation, speak about the words that are in the red font. God, our Father, today in remembrance and awe, 
we tread the holy ground of Calvary. This place of abandonment that has become the scene of our adoption. This place of suffering that has become the source of our peace. This place of violence that has become the battlefield on which love is victorious. Father, as we relive the events of this day, it is with awe that we count again the cost of our salvation. Words cannot be found to utter our thanksgiving except our silent adoration. In Jesus' name, Amen. And we continue to say in prayer together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let's sing again. We're going to sing two songs, so please feel free to stand or sit as you feel able or most comfortable. But we begin with how deep the Father's love for us have vast beyond all measure.
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we sing of the depth of your love for us. The love in which you gave up the splendour of heaven to come to earth, to live, to die, to rise again. And so in our worship, we thank you as we bless you. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings. as we come now to read and reflect on your word. Pray that you may speak through what has been prepared into our hearts and our lives today, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do be seated. Gordon's going to read to us from the book of Isaiah. The read is entitled, The Suffering and Glory of the Servant. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up 
and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what he, they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one for whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we hold him, held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed we all like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned to our own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was Lord, the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By the knowledge of my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You've got a, a pew Bible or a chair Bible in front of you or tucked in behind you or electronic device with Bibles on. Do you want to just turn to Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, which is on page 740 in our chair Bibles? We're going to sort of refer to it as we go through. So you kind of just want to keep your finger in on that passage, if you could, please. So this morning then we are drawing near the end of our Lent journey, uh, a title or journey that we've been called Shadows of the Cross. And so therefore I want to come on this Good Friday to Isaiah 53, although I asked Gordon to read from Isaiah 52 because we kind of have to go back a little bit before 53 to help us understand the context before we get to chapter 53 in itself. But Isaiah chapter 53 is quite a significant chapter in Scripture. It was written 700 years before Jesus. 
Charles Spurgeon described the book of Isaiah as being the Bible in a miniature and the gospel in essence. Why the Bible in miniature? Well, like the Bible, um, the Bible is made up of how many books? 66. And of which Isaiah has how many chapters? 66. You're going to catch on to this quite quickly, I think, aren't they? The Bible is divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And how many books are in the Old Testament? 39, yeah, which are largely about God's judgment. So how many are in the New Testament? 27, which are about God's grace and God's salvation. Isaiah, if we take that as a book, 66 chapters can be split into two distinct parts. Chapters 1 to 39, yeah, which are largely about God's judgment uh, on the southern kingdom of Judah, who were then taken into captivity in Babylon. And therefore, how many chapters are left? 27. Chapters 40 to 66, which highlight grace and salvation that comes through the Messiah. So Spurgeon was right, isn't he? It's a Bible in miniature. So the words that we've just had read to us from Gordon, these come from the second part. These are to do with grace and salvation. We also need to remember as we come to the book of Isaiah that Isaiah talks about two servants. In the first section, the servant is the nation of Israel. And it talks about the nation of Israel being an unfaithful servant who repeatedly fails to live up to God's standards, up to God's expectations of them being a light to the world and to all nations and and a light to, to the Gentiles. Whereas in the second part, Isaiah talks about the perfect servant of the Lord, about the Messiah who will fulfill the will of God. Now it's quite easy for us, isn't it, all these uh, thousands of years on, to look back and say, well this is about Jesus. But even the Gospel writers and New Testament writers recognised that this was a passage that reflected Jesus as the Messiah. And so Isaiah 53 itself is quoted in quite a number of books. It's quoted in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And then it's quoted in Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, 1 Timothy, Titus, Hebrew, 1 Peter and 1 John. And I'm going to test you on all of those (laughs) at the end. Okay. So they recognise the importance of this chapter, Isaiah 53, for us throughout the New Testament. Testament. Why? Because they know that it's a prophecy quoting about the Messiah. But and, and in it, Isaiah says, the message is about the servant of the Lord. So I want to spend some time this morning just thinking and reflecting on the servant of the Lord. Who is this servant? Hence, you need to keep page 740 in the chair Bibles open. You see, first of all, in Isaiah 52, verse 13, it says these words, isn't it? See my servant. And we need to remember, this is God speaking. This is God the Father saying, look at Jesus. Look at him. Check him out. Behold him. He is a sovereign servant. And so through Lent, and as we come to the Easter events of this weekend, before anything else, we need to remember Jesus came as a servant of God the Father to accomplish God's perfect will in redemptive history. If you remember, Jesus himself said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. And later he said, I have not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. We look back and see these words of being about Jesus as fulfilling the role of the Messiah. I have to say, Isaiah 52 verse 13 causes a lot of difficulty for Jewish rabbis today. Because while we look back at these words and say they're about Jesus, not everybody agrees with us. Of course, the New Testament writers do. That's why they quote it so many times. But this passage is under dispute by rabbis as to who is the servant of the Lord because there are several verses when Isaiah himself will call himself 
the servant of the Lord or God's servant. Or at times the nation of Israel is called God's servant. And yet it was actually believed and understood by historic ancient rabbis that Isaiah 52 and 53 were about the Messiah himself, not about the nation of Israel or a prophet, but about the Messiah. And so if you go back to some of the early Hebrew translations, they actually use these words in these verses, if you translate the Hebrew into English. They might say, Behold my servant, the Messiah, or the King Messiah who was wounded for our transgressions. We don't see that today, and you wouldn't see that if you had a Hebrew Bible today, because in the 11th century, Rabbi Rashi announced that Jesus is not the Messiah. And therefore, these words are not about Jesus. And so Isaiah 53 has become known in many synagogues and to many theologians as the the forbidden chapter. Why? Because Isaiah 53 is admitted from regular reading in Jewish synagogues today. It's no longer read in a Jewish synagogue. But I have to say to you, when I hear that, doesn't that make you more eager to want to read it and explore why? So we're going to do that. Who is this, this, who is this uh, servant that Isaiah 53 talks about? It begins in verse, uh, 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message or our report? That question implies, doesn't it, that actually only a few people are going to recognise the Messiah when he comes. And we look back and we can say, that's true of Jesus, isn't it? In fact, in his Gospel, John points to this in chapter 12. He said, although Jesus had done many signs before them, they did not recognise or believe in him, as the word of Isaiah said as a prophet. He quotes then, Lord, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So why was it that, that Jewish people rejected Jesus? Why do they reject the Old Testament testimony? Why do they reject Isaiah 53? Well, the answer is simply this, really. The Jewish religious system was all about seeking to establish their own righteousness. Paul comments on that in Romans chapter 10, that they've pushed aside God's righteousness and instead they've gone about seeking to establish their own righteousness that will make them right with God. And we have to say in modern society today, that's why people also reject Jesus, isn't it? They say, I don't need Jesus. I don't need God. And instead, what are they going to believe in? They believe in themselves. That they will save themselves. That their own goodness will be what sets them up for eternity. And yet we know as Christians that the message of the gospel is that we cannot save ourselves. We need someone to save us. And so Jesus is presented in Isaiah 53. He's the righteous servant, the one that is going to be largely rejected for who has believed our report. But what is he going to tell us about Jesus? He goes on to tell us, firstly, that he's going to be a suffering servant. If you go to verse 14, these words speak clearly about the suffering of the Messiah. He's going to have his face disfigured. Or in verses 4, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Verse 5, wounded and abruised. Verse 7, oppressed, afflicted, afflicted, led like a lamb to the slaughter. Verse 10, again, bruised. This is the servant, the Messiah. If we jump into the New Testament, when we know Jesus was arrested and brought before Pilate, Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. But he had Jesus scourged. That means Jesus was whipped to the point of having his back ripped to shreds. They blamed, the Roman soldiers blindfolded him. They plucked the beard from his face and they beat him. And Jesus was brought back to Pilate and Pilate stood him before the people. At this point, Jesus would not even look human. But the crowd shouted, crucify At that point, Jesus would have been given the upper part of the cross, the beam that got across his shoulders where his wrists would have been nailed to it, and he was made to carry that to the place of the skull, to Golgotha. This is suffering. He is a suffering servant. Do you know, no other religion, doesn't it, has at the heart of it the humiliation of its God that we have with Jesus. 
The world will look at this story this weekend and they will say, it don't make sense to us. They don't understand every year why, why, we, why we want to remember Good Friday. They don't even know why we call it Good Friday. <laughs> They'll say, it's bad, isn't it? It should be called Bad Friday. I think we perhaps should rename Good Friday and instead call it Great Friday. Because, yeah, it was bad for Jesus, but it's great for us because it procured our salvation, didn't it? Perhaps I should start a one-man worldwide protest. (laughs) Will you join me? (laughs) But what matters is that we're remembering that here is God's servant. This is God's suffering servant. And so it's at the very heart of what we believe, that Christ is paying the atonement, taking the punishment for our sin. Which reminds us that actually he's a suffering servant, but he is also a sinless servant. 53 verse 9, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at, at his death. But he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. A better translation of the second half of that verse says, no, he committed no sin, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Jesus was without sin. Even Pilate, didn't he, went on record saying, I can find nothing wrong with this man. And yet Jesus suffered. It was a suffering that was undeserved. But let's go back to the beginning of that verse 9. He died with the wicked, but was buried with the rich. For when Jesus was crucified on the cross, who was either side of him? Two robbers. He died on a cross next to two notorious criminals. He died with the wicked. And then in his death, he was taken off the cross, and in whose tomb was he put? Joseph of Arimathea. His death, his tomb, was with the rich in the garden of Gethsemane. Um, Not Gethsemane, yeah. In the tube garden, yeah, not get somebody. In death, buried in a rich man's tomb. The tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. I read a story this week about the evangelist D.L. Moody. Have you heard of D.L. Moody? Yeah, he lived in the sort of late 1800s. He was uh, a, a famous evangelist. Uh, he's sometimes described as being the most famous evangelist on earth. Um, I think Paul might kind of dispute that, maybe, the Apostle Paul. Uh, But he was a preacher and a pastor uh, at Moody Bible College in Chicago. Uh, But as well as the church, he also had, uh, in Massachusetts, a theological seminary where he would train pastors. And uh, he would spend a couple of weeks with them. And on one occasion, this story goes, that Moody invited pastors over from Europe to America for a conference. And uh, they went, and uh, during the day, they would sit like you're doing now, and they would listen to Moody, they would hear everything that he had to say, and then at night they were really good. They just retreated to their dormitories to go to bed. They didn't go to the bar or anything like that. Um, We might do at conferences, I guess. They would listen to Moody during the day, and at night go back to their dormitories. And and, uh, the story goes that at this point it was quite custom, and I guess it still is in some very posh hotels, uh, that what you would do at night if you were from Europe, in Europe, you would take your shoes off, put them outside your door at night, and then magically, somehow, they would be clean by the morning. But it wasn't really magic, because you would have hall servants who would come, take the shoes, polish them up, and put them back, so the next morning you had clean shoes. Anybody been in a hotel where that still happens today? Oh, Gordon, yeah, obviously being the very posh ones then, haven't you? But uh, there we go. Most of us wear trainers now, we wouldn't want them buffed up, would we? And uh, the story goes that uh, as Moody was walking through the corridor of the dormitories, he noticed all these shoes outside the rooms. But this was happening in America. And that wasn't a custom in America. You didn't put your shoes outside, you had to clean your own. But Moody thought, well, these people are from Europe. What can we do about it? And so he called all the uh, students of his theological seminary to him and said, no, no, this is a custom in Europe. What I want you to do is to go through the corridors, collect the shoes, polish them, and put them back. And his students said, no. We've got better things to do. We're going to read the Bible 
and we're going to pray. We're not going to do it. And off they went. And the story says that Moody that night went through the whole, past all the dormitories and collected all the shoes and himself polished them and then returned them ready for the morning. He didn't have to do that, did he? He was the star attraction. They'd gone to hear him speak and preach to them uh, during the day. But here was a man who, by many, had an esteemed position, who stooped to do a gesture that was lovelier and more dramatic than anything he could say. You know, when we think about the life of Jesus, in the passage of Philippians, we're reminded that Jesus gave up the splendor of heaven to what? Become like his creation. He became like a hall servant, taken on the form, the nature of his creation. In fact, Paul says he was in very nature God. And so he took, he made himself of no reputation, came in the likeness of sinful flesh and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He stepped down from heaven to the lowest place on earth, to a cross where he died sinless for you and for me. He didn't have to do it. But why did God allow that? Because God loves you. And God loves me. Next we notice he's a silent servant in verse 7. Oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers in silent, he did not open his mouth. I'll be careful how I say this this morning. Suffering people are not silent, are they? Have you found that to be your experience? Don't shout out yes too loud. (laughs) Suffering people are quite vocal about their suffering. I mean, we've all been in places where you suddenly get a, oh, my back, oh. The older we get, oh, my neck's really stiff. They let us know, don't they? Oh, my arm's a bit painful. I I did my knee in this week, and I've let Maxie know all week that my knee is quite painful. I probably shouldn't be wandering back and forth to this side this week. Yeah, we like to let people know about our aches and pains. If if we're suffering, people know it. They hear our our groans. And yet, the analogy here is that sheep are silent. Like a sheep before its shearers is silent. You know, I've, I've discovered this week, because I was reading around about sheep, and so I've read that sheep like to be sheared by their shepherd or the shearer. Because shepherds who take care of their sheep, and the sheep trust the shepherd. They like to be sheared. They like to be sheared also because, what do sheep grow? Wool. So it's not difficult, is it? <laughs> and, and we wear wool to keep us warm, don't we? So if you imagine being a sheep and you're wearing your own woolly jumper, yeah, it gets quite heavy when it gets wet and everything, doesn't it? And uh, so sheep, to sheep, to get sheared means that they kind of come away going, wow, that feels good. Yeah? That feels so... They love it. That's why they'll, they'll lay there, whatever, as they get sheared without making a fuss. The weight comes off, they feel cooler, and more than anything else, that smelly bit around their bottoms disappears, doesn't it? Yeah? Sheep like to be sheared. And so they follow the shepherd pretty much in silence to be sheared. But when it's time to be slaughtered, those sheep also trust the shepherd. And it said they'll follow, not even say a word, they'll follow the shepherd to their death because they trust the shepherd when Jesus was arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin the high priest, the Jewish leaders they accused him falsely uh, about stuff that he didn't do but Jesus we read in scripture kept silent then they brought him to Herod and and Herod questioned him with many words and, and what did Jesus do? he answered nothing he was silent Then he went before Pilate, and again, the Bible says he answered him not one word. 
And Pilate quite marvelled at this, it says, because he'd seen a lot of prisoners before, and lots of prisoners would be begging for their release. They'd be protesting their innocence. And yet Jesus said nothing. He was a silent servant. He's also going to be in this passage a substitutionary servant. Look at verse 5. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He goes on in verses 10 and 12 to say he's going to be made an offering for our sin. You see, Isaiah 53 wants to answer the biggest question that humanity has ever had. The biggest question isn't, where should I invest in stocks and shares? The biggest question is, how can a person be made right with God? Or how can the unrighteous be made to know and able to know a righteous God? And this chapter, Isaiah 53, it answers that. The book of Romans answers it as well. And it simply says this, a servant must become a substitute. A sinner can only be saved because the servant becomes the substitute for the sinner. And so all of God's wrath, all of God's judgment that's deserved because of our sin was put on Jesus. Do you remember we talked about that a few weeks ago on a Sunday when we looked about Jesus being the scapegoat? Yes, Steve, we remember that. Well, Peter Borden preached it that week. Being a substitute means he could also be a saving servant. Go back to verse 15 in chapter 52. He shall sprinkle many nations. That phrase refers back to the time of Moses when the high priest would take a dip hyssop into the blood of a lamb and sprinkle it on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the nation. But the blood of Jesus wasn't shed for one nation, was it? It was shed for all people. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And that's the heart of the gospel, that the innocent takes the place of the guilty. Paul understood that. He wrote a whole book about it, the book of Romans. But he also wrote one verse about it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Paul wrote, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in And so as we come to the cross this Good Friday, we need to remember that the essence of sin is humanity substituting himself or ourselves for God. But the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for humanity on the cross. So who's going to be saved? Well, in Isaiah 53, verse 11, God says, he shall justify many. He doesn't say all. Because not everyone will let the Messiah, let Jesus be their substitute. And so this Easter, let me remind you, Jesus died for you. But we need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. We need to lay on the death of Jesus to be for us. And if you haven't done so this morning, I just want to encourage you, maybe today is the day where you say, I'm going to do that. I'm ready to say, in simple faith, that, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. That you died for me. To take my sin from me. So that I can be one of the many who are saved. So may we turn from our sin and turn to Jesus as our saviour. And may we seek to live for him to be our Lord. Shall we bow our heads as we pray together? Father God, thank you that 700 years before Jesus was born, you spoke through Isaiah about how we can be saved, about how we can be made right with you. We thank you, therefore, that as we come at this Good Friday, that you've fulfilled your promise, your word, that you allowed your son to die on a cross for us take our place to take from us our sin so that we may be made right with you and so as we come to the cross today this good Friday 
this great Friday for us, we come with thankful, grateful hearts. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We invite those who are going to sing to us just to come forward because I'm going to give us an opportunity just to respond to what Christ uh, has been practically saying to us today. On the table before us, either side of this cross, are some images of, of the cross or related to, to Good Friday. And as they sing to us, I want to invite you just to, in a haphazard way, whenever you're ready, just to come forward and, and look at the table. There's 32 different images. So I want you just to very quickly, as you come to the table, to look at the images. And if there's an image that kind of says, that's the one, that helps you understand Good Friday, the cross of Jesus, I want you just to take, take the image off the table and just return back to your seat. And as the singers continue to sing to us, just to use the, the image before you, just to reflect on what is God saying to you today. So we need to be quite unchristian at this point. Because if you wait to the end, the good images might go. Okay? If you're first, you've got more choice. Okay? But I want to invite you to do that. And then, just as they finish the singing, if we haven't finished collecting images, we'll just continue in a moment of silence as those images are collected and taken uh, as we sit and reflect on them together. That we might be forgiven, he died to make us good. That we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. There was no Sir. 
the thrust by Galilee. O oh, come up hills above, where Jesus loves to share with thee the silence of eternity, interpreted by love. Drop thy still dews of quietness, till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress, and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let breath become that fresh return. Speak through the earthquake, wind, and fire. O oh, still small voice of calm. There is a green hill far I invite you just to hold the image that you've collected. What is God saying to you today about his love, the cross for you? And how will you respond? Will you offer yourself in adoration and worship to him? We acknowledge that we cannot save ourselves. Well, it is through Christ that we are saved. You might like to take the image that you've picked up today, take it home, put it in your Bible at home, so that as you read Scripture, you are reflecting back onto the cross, or you put it on your mantelpiece and uh, look at it and remind yourselves of God's love for you. There are other pictures on the table, so it might be at the end of the service you want to come forward and take some other pictures and give them to family or friends and use them to talk about Easter and the love of God for them. For we know that we cannot save ourselves. But it is in Christ alone that we are saved. So will you join with me if you're able as we stand to sing the hymn together. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song.
be seated. Just a few notices before uh, we finish. Um, just to say this morning, or at lunchtime, at 12 o'clock, there is a march of hope in the town centre, uh, leaving from Emmanuel Twel- Church at 12, going to the Italian Gardens for service at 12.30. If it's raining, it's straight at Emmanuel Church for 12. Um, there is an order of service on the churches together in Western website, so if you've got a smartphone, you can download the order of service uh, for that before you leave using the church uh, Wi-Fi. If you're hoping to go to the World Church's uh, walk and service, you've missed it. It started 20 minutes ago, so you're better off going up the road uh, here. Um, tomorrow after, uh, this afternoon in uh, at Whirl is uh, Easter egg hunt and activity trail two till four, so you're all welcome to join them uh, for that. Um, there's not a slide for it, but tomorrow afternoon at the Italian Gardens between 11 and 3, uh, Destiny Church are going to be uh, in the town centre um, using praise and worship songs and giving out Easter eggs. So that's worth turning up for, isn't it? <laughs> but um, they're, they're there. And then there's a Sunday on vigil service at 6.30. Don't forget the clocks change on Saturday night, so it's really 5.30, isn't it? Getting up, really. Um, so that's a Marine Parade opposite Carton Street. Uh, again, there is an order of service on the Churches Together in Western website. Um, if you click on the poster picture, it takes you to the order of the service uh, to download. Download. That's going to be followed by bacon rabattis, or non-meat alternatives for those who don't eat bacon. So, um, vegan bacon, I suppose they call it, don't they? But there we go. Um, we have a service here on Sunday morning then at 10.30 on Sunday, a celebration of Easter Day. You're welcome to come and join us uh, for that. In a moment, we're going to close with some words that are on the screen. And I would ask you, uh, as that service is closed, as part of our Good Friday, remembering the death of Jesus, that we don't just suddenly burst into conversation together, but that we just continue to remain the church to be just a place of quiet uh, and reflection. And some might choose just to continue to stay and just sit in, in silence before God together. So as I use these words, if you would speak back to me from where you're seated, the words that are in the red font. For Lord Jesus, you carried our sins in your own body on the tree. You came so that we might have life. May we and all who remember this day find new life in you. We ask this now in the name of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.